All right, so here we are again with the Vicky series. Tonight we're going to be discussing Israel-Palestine and what we can expect from the Biden administration. Uh, the new administration, uh, President Trump made some changes, uh, some, some that are, would be very controversial, uh, mostly, I guess, what he did was mainly controversial. So we're expecting that, uh, that perhaps President Biden will be different, perhaps not. With us tonight to discuss this issue is Musa Isak, who's the president of the Burlington Bethlehem Arad Sister City Program. Musa was born in Palestine in a village called Abud. He was, he came to the United States and married the lovely Chris Peterson and was an engineer at IBM for a long time. In 1991, he, Chris, and a number of us formed a sister city relationship between Burlington, Bethlehem and Palestine and Arad in Israel, because we really firmly believe that even though our national government might be adverse to particularly to some of those uh, areas in the world, we believe that as a sister city, we should be friendly to those countries and we should basically have our own foreign policy in a lot of ways and kind of ignore as much as policy of the United States and instead have a citizen diplomacy with the cities of the world. So Moose is the president of that organization and maybe he can tell us a little bit about what he thinks the Biden administration is gonna do also what um, the sister city has done over the years. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Musa. But remember that this is a discussion. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them and we hope we can answer them. Okay, Musa, take it away. All right, uh, just a little correction. Uh, my sweetheart, uh, Chris here, we met in Egypt. We were going All to right. the same, we were going to the same college, AUC, the American University in Cairo. She came from Georgetown to study Arabic. I was studying engineering. We met and uh, the rest is history. So that's where it came from. So and anyway, your history you know, included coming here to the United States, right? Right, yes. she, she dragged me over and I loved it, you know. Yes? <laughs> so, and uh, we ended up in uh, Burlington, uh, Vermont. Uh, I couldn't have chosen a better place, truly. You know, when I was looking for jobs, uh, uh, IBM is the one that uh, brought me over to Vermont and uh, we, the rest is history. Uh, you know, I will start with the larger picture and sort of speak, then zoom in on Beth Bethlehem since we are zooming these days. And, uh, you know, uh, Bethlehem, Palestine in the West Bank, a uh, sister city with Burlington. Uh, we started the project with uh, Sandy, Raz Payne, Sister Miriam, myself and the others you know joined in as we as we went but that's how it started in 1991 and we were the first american city to be a sister city with a palestinian city the f absolutely number one and uh, there were probably hundreds of cities already uh, sister cities with israeli cities but not with a palestinian city and it was not an easy birth, but we made it work. You know, lots of good people worked on it and uh, <clears throat> it came into existence. I just wanna mention a couple of things, you know, before we go to Biden and Trump and 100% uh, uh, Bethlehem and the West Bank, you know, uh, the rest of the occupied territories are under total Israeli occupation since 1967. So that's 53 years that's two generations. What is a generation? 20 25. years, 25 years, two generations have been born and uh, will die under this occupation. I hope it doesn't happen that way, but it's just going on way too long. You know, it's not good for the Israelis to be abusers and it's not good for the Palestinians to be abused. Occupations are major abusers. And uh, the grotesque wall which is 28 feet high, uh, hems the town, uh, cuts Bethlehem of 80% of its land. It's all about land. You know, that's, I want that totally understood. Uh, every Palestinian city suffers the same fate, stripped of its land. It happened in 1948 when Israel first was created. 
all of the Palestinian uh, population centers in the Galilee, uh, Nazareth, all of them were stripped of all of their land and they were hemmed into these little bento stands in Israel and in the West Bank, the same deal now. And uh, land is gone, uh, was, uh, the land was expropri uh, appropriated into the National Jewish Fund, not to ever be given to anybody, but of somebody of Jewish background, not to be sold, uh, you know, it doesn't sound good, not to be sold or uh, rented or anything to anybody, but of uh, Jewish background. And uh, you can check all of this, you know, we have to really address the history where Bethlehem came into the picture. Uh, so Area C in the West Bank, what they did very smart in the Oslo deal, they came with Area A, which is controlled by the Palestinian Authority, which means they are responsible for collecting their garbage, uh, not much more. And uh, Area C com comprises 60% of the occupied areas, you know, the West Bank, Jerusalem, Ramallah, all of that area, 60% is under total Israeli control, which means Palestinians cannot use it for, most importantly, for natural, uh, including Bethlehem, uh, for uh, what do you call it, natural Palestinian uh, population growth. So everybody ends up crowded in these cities and generation after generation, there have no place to go. And you end up with uh, overcrowding, uh, misery. And, you know, I think the ultimate aim is to drive these people, make their life miserable until they leave, you know, the land, and uh, which is not good. The, so, you know, I mentioned it's an insidious way to control the Palestinian population, natural growth, a crowded cities, pressure people to leave. That's really what my my okay, Musa, could I ask could I ask a question please okay yes. so this this uh, occupation occurred in 1967 correct correct okay and that was a war was that the six-day war yes okay so that, and in that war the Israeli armies occupied the west occupied right the west okay. bank Gaza the Sinai and the uh, Golan Heights so Golan. the West Bank and East Jerusalem and East Jerusalem in the West Bank. So the West Bank, you know, remember, uh, you know, we are talking about governments. We are not talking about the people. The West Bank is the crown jewel that the Israeli government is after, and uh, you know that includes Bethlehem, Jerusalem, all of that area. It's the land. So sixty percent already of the occupied areas in 1967, including Bethlehem's eighty percent of their land is gone. It, uh, it was confiscated from Bethlehem. The, so when, when you see the wall, they say, oh, security and all of that. The main purpose of the wall, one of the main reasons around Bethlehem, it's a very sad scene. If you look in Bethlehem and surrounded by 28 foot wall with wires on top, a concrete wall, you know, you could, blocks your view from everything. And uh, <clears throat> with wires on top and uh, watch towers and all of that, you feel like you are in uh, prison. But the main purpose of it, when they built the wall around Bethlehem is to cut off Bethlehem from access to their land. Olive groves, these are the natural areas for population expansion, no longer available to the people of Bethlehem or to the people of my village. You know, also area C took 90% of the uh, land of my village. It's called area C. So you cannot do anything in area C. If you build anything, what you see in the news lately is demolitions, house demolition. So people, you know, because they have nowhere to go, they build without permit. Israel doesn't give them permits. They build without the permit. And then the Israelis send the bulldozers to take their houses down and they end up, you know, homeless. <clears throat> Economy in Bethlehem. Do you have enough sad news? I'll give you some more. And then I'll give you some really good news. Uh, economy in Bethlehem is 70% dependent on tourism. Tourism in Bethlehem now in the whole West Bank is zero, nothing. And then on top of that, you know, they have the pandemic. It started in Bethlehem by, a, I think it was a Greek. We don't want to blame anything on anybody, but Greek to, uh, tourists were in Bethlehem. And I give Greece uh, incredible uh, credit 
uh, when the Greek tourists came back to Greece and they discovered that they have COVID, they called Bethlehem municipality and told them, you'd better do something because our tourists brought you a gift. And uh, so uh, Bethlehem went into lockdown. The whole West Bank went into lockdown and then Israel went into lockdown. And they were successful in the beginning the West Bank actually did much, fared much better for the COVID than Israel. You know, Israel was still more open, and uh, but now it came back. And uh, now, you know, I saw by uh, Alice Rothschild, uh, if you check her on Facebook, she's awesome. You know, she's a, a doctor. She's been here. And she's been here yeah. Uh, yeah. many times. And uh, she showed, she's a, MD, she showed graphs, despite the vaccination in Israel, the West Bank still has lower, you know, it's bad in both places. The, despite the vaccination that has been hailed as a major example to the civilized world, but uh, no, no vaccination for the people who are under their control, which are the Palestinians. They are not under the control of Jordan or America or anybody. They are under total control of Israel. And that people don't dare say anything about, you know, and I just don't. So they are not vaccinating the Palestinians. They should be. They are the occupying power and they should be responsible for both people. And uh, but anyway, what uh, Dr. Rothschild showed is the graphs, the graphs uh, still in Israel, despite the vaccination, is going uh, worse than in the Palestinian territories because of the, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, because of the uh, fundamentalist or the... Uh, what, oh, the Hasidim. The Hasidim. The Orthodox. Uh, the Orthodox are not following the rules, so they, they still really have issues with the... COVID uh, spread. So that's on uh, vaccination. Uh, so I wanna give you good news before I continue. I have a couple more minutes. Uh, in Christmas, Bethlehem had no choice. You know, every year you see Bethlehem literally teeming with tourists for Christmas Eve and Christmas day celebration. You know, thousands of people from all over the world. This year they had a virtual one. The mayor of Bethlehem sent a note to all sister cities and they have tons of them, you know, in Italy, in Germany, in the United States, Latin America, uh, requesting that we send music to share, you know, cheer up uh, Bethlehem and they will uh, air it out on Christmas Eve. So we immediately thought of who can we go to first. We knew Chris and I went to our favorite uh, women's chorus uh, called Bella Voce. If you have not uh, heard them, you must, because they are, the, I think they are the crown jewel of Burlington and Vermont. So what we did is we uh, talked to uh, uh, Don Ellis and a neighbor of ours who's in, in the chorus, amazing chorus, and they obliged immediately. They were uh, honored, they said, to, to be a part of this. They sent us two videos beautiful videos of, Beth of Vermont with, with their music, you know, uh, little town of Bethlehem, but they also were wise. They said, probably everybody is gonna send little town of Bethlehem. They gave us another song, which was- uh, um, The Wexford Carol. Wexford Carol was both of them magnificent. You really should show them. You would be proud of the videos as Vermonters. And we sent them immediately to Bethlehem and then I was really nervous. Are they gonna show them? You know, how, we didn't know how they are gonna show them. So I kept going to Facebook of Bethlehem municipality. So if you have Facebook, go to Bethlehem municipality and still there. And at four o'clock, you know, Christmas Eve, which means it was 12 midnight in, uh, in Bethlehem, our videos were absolutely the first to air out to the whole world. And thousands of people have been watching these, you know, and ours, uh, and then they had, you know, music from Russia, from uh, the United States, from, from all Paris. over Paris, uh, from uh, Vatican, and ours from Burlington, Vermont, were the first two, and they still come out the first two. So anybody that goes to that music uh, deal from Bethlehem will will stumble on our uh, videos from. Uh, 
from uh, uh, Burlington, Vermont, from Bella Voce. If you have not seen, uh, how many of you have uh, seen Bella Voce? Can you raise your hand? No, I haven't. I haven't. Awesome. You must, it's really, they're magnificent. They are uh, amazing, They're just beautiful. To us, to Chris and I, we have been, uh, they usher in the Christmas and the holiday season to us, you know, for us. And, uh, and they have a spring concert. Maybe they'll have one this year. We don't know. You know, I want to mention before I go to Biden, and I'm coming to it in two minutes, uh, my dad once, you know, I mean, we cannot hide. It, the, there is a conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis. And my dad, who was a sixth grader, but the wisest person I've ever met in my life, and uh, heard us, this is in the United States, friends of ours and us, discussing, you know, why are the Israelis, you know, how could they become abusers when they were abused in Europe? We know the history of pogroms and all of that. And how could they become abusers of the Palestinians? And my dad, you know, in his simple way, really explained it to me for years. I've been trying to figure it out. And he explained it to all of us. <clears throat> we were translating to him. And he said, this conflict really has nothing to do with religion. Israelis that came to Palestine were Europeans. And they treated the indigenous population. He was there like Europeans treated indigenous population, populations everywhere, the US, Australia, South Africa, and Israel. So he says it has nothing to do with religion. It has to do, they were Europeans, they looked down at us and they said, we can take everything they've got, uh, their inheritance, their land, their, and that's exactly what really unfolded. And then he said, you know, to uh, counter our people resisting, you know, the occupation with the Israelis. He said, we resisted the Turkish occupation, which occupied them for 500 years, by the way. You know, it was a long occupation. Palestinians and the rest of the Arab world resisted the Turkish occupation, not because they were Muslims, because most 90% of the Palestinians are Muslims, 10% are Christians at the time and not, not uh, because they were Muslim, we resisted them because they were occupiers. And then Palestinians were lucky, they got occupied by the British in, uh, after World War I. And he said, we resisted the British occupation that was brutal also, as brutal as the Turkish occupation, not because they were Christian. You know, my dad was Christian. He said, we didn't uh, resist them because they were Christian, we resisted them because they were occupiers. And then now we are resisting the Israeli occupation it has nothing to do with being Jewish or not. It is a brutal occupation that must end. And uh, I hope all of us, you know, we really have to work on that. You know, we have to push the Biden. Uh, so that brings us to Biden versus Trump. Under Trump, I think it got to the worst ever. I've never seen it. Trump, what Trump did, he moved, you know, these are unimportant to me, moved the, uh, the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, you know, symbolic, very bad symbolism. But what he did is he cut off all of the uh, money that went to UNRWA, you know, UN uh, that takes care of the Palestinian schools in the camps. Millions of people depend on the United uh, Palestinian refugees, depend on the United Nations for schools, for food, for all of that, cut off all of our funds to that. And then he cut off all of the funds to the Palestinian Authority, which is a useless authority, takes care of the Palestinians, but, but they control nothing, no borders, no skies, no resources. They, under their feet, even the water that under the West Bank is not controlled by the Palestinian Authority, it's controlled by Israel. And uh, so, they uh, really uh, hurt the Palestinians big time. So I don't dare now say, oh, it may get better under the Biden administration because every time I have said this in the past or any of us have said, oh, the situation is gonna get better, it gets a lot worse. So I'm gonna dare just say, 
it may get a little better under Biden, but I honestly don't think that Biden and his team, unless we push him, you know, I like the Biden administration better than the Trump, the disastrous Trump administration, but we have got to push him. I don't think they are gonna invest any uh, uh, effort or any uh, capital. capital in uh, in fixing, you know, doing anything for the Palestinians. And what you will hear always when they discuss that with any of the Biden administration people, they'll say, oh, what do you think we will do? They'll say two-state solution. That is the safe uh, retreat for, for anybody who wants to say, oh, you know, we want peace without really doing anything to help peace come about. While, so when they say two-state solution, they're supported while allowing Israel to gobble up the rest of the West Bank, you know, and uh, so we really have to, I think, you know, under the Biden administration, we have to absolutely push him uh, to do the right thing. They are gonna do the right thing on many issues, you know, that we care about in this country. But when it comes to Palestine, Israel, I think they are gonna not do too much. They will uh, uh, probably restore the money to UNRWA, which is uh, UNRWA, which is very important. Uh, the, the money to the Palestinian Authority, which pays policemen, you know, ag again, it goes to Palestinian people who are dependent on these salaries and they are absolutely dead in the water now with the economy. So the West Bank, I have no idea in Bethlehem, in Ramallah, in all of it, you know, including my village, I have zero idea. I talked to my relatives, they all say, thank goodness, we are okay, we manage. I, but to tell you the truth, I have no idea how they uh, survive because they are hemmed in, they are totally uh, closed in, they cannot leave the West Bank, they cannot go anywhere without Israel's uh, permission. And those permits are very far and few in between. Okay, um, how about any questions before I ask some questions? Anybody else have any comments? Questions? Uh, Frank does, Frank, Frank. Yes. I'm, quite, I'm quite sure that I read uh, within the last uh, week that uh, the monies have been restored uh, to the Palestinians, uh, the UNRWA and, and the uh, other. I haven't heard about UNRWA. You know, I hope I hope UNRWA before anything else. I think they're in process. But they are in in process, and the I think I heard the same thing, Frank, that they are in the process of restoring the money to the Palestinian Authority, which is beans compared to what Israel gets. You know, I think they were giving them four hundred million. Uh, Israel gets three point eight billion a year from us. So, so did the United States cut off funding? to Palestine also? Yes. Okay, Zero. so, but the United Everything. States gives huge aid to Israel. Correct. Right, okay. So since Trump came in, I think second year probably, or soon after, he closed the Palestinian embassy in Washington, shuttered it down, uh, shuttered it down and cut off all aid to the Palestinian Authority. And then, you know, to really and all Palestinian projects and all Palestinian projects. You know, whether uh, by uh, what the hospitals, call, uh, hospitals, all yeah. of that. The the other thing, you know, to help the Palestinians even more. Sometimes they had money coming in from the Gulf countries. So you know, for you to understand what's going on behind the scenes, then Kushner and company did all of these deals with Saudi Arabia and the Gulf. Those were all absolutely to squeeze the Palestinians to death. No money coming in from any of those places. So now, I don't know, that's why I say I have no idea. At least before, you know, some money would come from the Gulf, you know, to help them, you know, pittance. But now with these uh, deals between Israel, you know, there is, when they tell you, oh, Israel is making peace with the, the Gulf, who cares? Uh, that's not the issue. The real peace that I'll be proud of is when they, Palestinian and Israelis can live in peace as equals together. That's the real peace. This here is all working on the edges for evil reasons. In my in my uh, uh, book, they really are to totally strangle the Palestinians, and that's exactly what happened. You know, no money coming from the Gulf, from Saudi Arabia, or all of these. Places. These are reactionary regimes. Uh, this is being uh, <laughs> this is being recorded. I hope I'm okay. You know, I'm seeing all of this, but uh, 
I don't well, care. Any any questions? I have a question, Musa. Could you even could you talk about? I, you know, I think that when when you talk and when I talk, I think it assumes that people understand the whole hist historical uh, development of Israel and Palestine. And I'm not certain when people talk, for instance, about the recognition of Jerusalem as the Israeli capital, that people understand the importance of that. Could you? Because right. Trump did that too. I mean, yes. that's. I mean, no other, no other superpower has done that, correct? Uh, no, no other administration has done that before. No other administration, although Amer they have, American administration, right, they, and they seem to want to, correct? Yeah, but they never done it. You know, they so never that's, did it. Okay, yeah. so what is this? Why? Why is that so important? That Israel, yeah. that the United States did that. International law. You know, it's international law. Uh, they they occupied areas mm -hmm. have got to be solved correctly. You cannot you cannot have an occupying power. Two things that are very clear in international law: you cannot change anything in the occupied territories, and you cannot move your own population in occupied to occupied areas. They've done both. So it is against international law, pure and simple. And uh, you know the the thing with with the uh, moving populations into the West Bank, it's right. still happening, and it is on Palestinian land being grabbed from my village, from Bethlehem's land, from, and it's uh, it's counterproductive, you know, on the it's obstacles to real peace, you know, and uh, we have to fix that. Okay, well maybe you could talk a little bit about that because the settlements have increased, correct? Yes. Okay, but they they have increased over the years. But there was there an increase in the settlement Jewish only settlements, correct, on the West Bank? They are all Jewish only settlements. I know. So can maybe you could so that has increased. So they've basically not only had the occupation, they've moved populations of Israelis into the West Bank as well. Right. Right. Yes. And those are those form really tiny cities in a way, don't they, or what? They are not tiny cities. They are bigger than Burlington, most of them. Uh, you know, they are huge, 50,000, 60,000, 70,000. For example, uh, around uh, Bethlehem, uh, it's run by, uh, they took a mountain, it's called Abu Ghnim, and now I forgot what they, the Israelis changed the name. It became a settlement. It was really a beautiful mountain full of uh, uh, pine trees. You know, It was like a, uh, a reserve. And uh, they stripped it of the trees and they built a huge settlement. Uh, I don't know the number, but I would estimate, you know, minimum 50,000. And uh, uh, Harhoma? Harhoma. Harhoma. Is the, uh, Harhoma. 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 Harhoma is the, new, the name of the settlement. And around my village, for example, which is about 20 miles northwest of Bethlehem, uh, they took a third of my village, the land, that is owned by relatives, you know, private land, uh, took it and put a settlement on it. There are three settlements rung, uh, ringing my, my village. And uh, it's Jewish only settlements with Jewish only roads. You know, this is really what hurts me the most is how could we agree to, how can you justify, you cannot justify it by any means. You cannot say security reasons or any of that because other, regimes did that before, justified evil with uh, security. You can, how can you support, how can we support a system that allows roads for only one religious group or one national group? You know, talking about supremacy, we are now, you know, it's in the air in the United States. White supremacy, you know, if you have been watching all day, I have. Uh, watching the TV, how the supremacists attacked our uh, uh, capital. Uh, white supremacy, yeah. Palestinians know what supremacy is. Oh. It is national and religious supremacy. When somebody tells you, God gave me what you've got, it's over. You cannot, there is no further discussion. And I know uh, uh, reasonable people will say that's not acceptable. You know, you cannot use religion and the Bible to justify. But unfortunately, it has been. So I love Lincoln, President Lincoln. Today I was saying to Chris, you know, I've heard it. Who said it? And she found it. Beware if somebody says, if somebody says God on, is on my side. 
beware of a person like that. Be, I, I think Cliff has a question. Be friends with yeah. I'll be friends with somebody who says, "I hope God is. I hope I am on God's side." Uh, what, anyway. what Lincoln? What Lincoln said was, "I hope God's on my side, but I have to have Kentucky on my side." <laughs> yeah, we, that's uh, what he said. I think. Anyway, no, no, he didn't say that. He didn't say that. Uh, okay, we Cliff, just, Cliff, we just, Cliff, yeah. Cliff, <laughs> Cliff. M Musa, thank you for your sharing and also very much the personal experiences with your family. As you mentioned, the $3.8 billion um, that are used that the United States um, gives Israel on an annual basis. It was during the Trump administrations that the parameters of that funding was changed. And so previously to President Trump, um, the ceiling was at $3.8 billion. But with the legislation during his term in office, uh, $3.8 billion is now the lowest amount. So we'll be up to the up to the government to decide how much Israel will get. Now, uh, yesterday, I had the privilege of being a part of the American Friends Service Committee announcement about a new website. And uh, they are calling it uh, Connecting the Shots. And in the chat, I put the link uh, mm -hmm. to that website and it's interactive. And I learned for the first time that Israel is the largest weapons producer in the world. Larger and so, than the United States? Really? Is that larger right? than the, correct. Larger I, than the United States. And I, you know, today, today talking um, with some other Quakers uh, who have been at the site and, and working, there are 110 different countries that are listed uh, are part of that website. And it tells the relationship with Israel and uh, the United States and different dynamics. Um, it's very interacting. The country that right now is buying the most weapons from Israel is Turkey. Mm. Mm -hmm. I found that quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, so one so of the other things, Musa, that, that they shared were in Tel Aviv is a, a big convention center right. for when they have those conventions that where they are selling different styles of weapons, surveillance materials, et cetera. And so in the midst of the different booths and exhibits, they have platforms set up. And at different times during the event, um, those companies will put on a show featuring the Israeli military and who, whoever the other people are, usually Palestinians, sort of right, a good right. versus evil, mm -hmm. and demonstrate their new products. Fine. Yeah. That's so, do you have a question? Uh, yeah. Right. So, so to you, Musa, um, how Israel, I know, has used the Palestinians as laboratory kind of animals for, for their different products, especially their weapon products. What experiences might, what experiences do your family face where they, they feel like they're still a part of, the, of any laboratory kind of experiences? You know, I think, I think the weapons uh, deal, uh, the, the people who have really suffered the most right. the in Gaza. Gaza. is in Gaza, in yeah, the West Bank. Right. It's in the West Bank. My village is in the West Bank, about uh, 20 miles northwest of Jerusalem, actually less than that. Uh, they suffer. Uh, it's major suffering anyway. You know, they don't have control. Uh, my village supposedly has 20% of the water aquifer. Mayor Clavel is here. He knows about water and uh, good to see Mayor you. Mayor Clavel is here? Yes. I don't see him. And so uh, water aquifer, uh, my village supposedly sits on top of 20% of the water aquifer of the West Bank. They have zero access to that water. That's why the three settlements around my village is to steal that water, you know, and control it. Uh, you know, the, the thing, I just want to mention something uh, because if we want to solve the problem, which I really hope we are all solvers, 
you know, by understanding the issues. As Americans, you know, I'm here, uh, Frank Donath, uh, Jamie Lees, uh, uh, Robin Lloyd, Musa, we are all equal under the law, we hope, you know, we are equal under the law. In 12 hours, I tell my friends, in 12 hours, we get on the airplane, this is when COVID is over, we get on the airplane, we go to Israel, we are equal here, we live in the same neighborhood uh, as neighbors. We get one, uh, my friend, the Jew, and myself, the Palestinian, we will get on an airplane, land in Tel Aviv. They will be treated, they've never been there. They will be treated like kings and queens, and they will be treated like not very well. And uh, so that's, you know, that's uh, an issue. We have to, uh, somebody can make Alia who's never been, uh, ever lived there, you know, originally from Russia or from New York City. And uh, Musa uh, and his offspring cannot ever go there. I cannot to live. I can go there for three months and they will watch me very carefully, get out. You know, you are never to be permanently uh, appropriated back to Palestine. So, you know, these are issues. For example, I mentioned uh, to people, if somebody tells me, and by the way, there are many around us, you know, who are saying that we want to make this country a Christian country. I would, we would all go crazy about that. We would all reject that because it's not just a cute name. If you say, oh, this is a Christian country, then somebody is going to be, the Christians are going to be in the supremacy uh, uh, seat and everybody else is going to be second or third grade uh, uh, person. So, you know, again, when people say, oh, this is the Jewish state, why can't it be the state for everybody, you know, where equality reigns? So when they say Jewish state, it is supremacy. It is saying Jews have the upper seat, the upper hand, and everybody else is second citizen, is second grade citizen. So it's, it, these are structural problems, you know, in Bethlehem everywhere, we have Robin, Robin. Where is she? You're Robin? Muted, Robin? You are muted. I don't see her. I signal to her. Does somebody, somebody signal? Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, good to be on this call. Um, my question is of the Palestinians who live in Israel, as I mean, I thought there were, they were 10 or 15, 20% of the population of Israel is Palestinian now, but they, they must call themselves Israelis because they are in the Israeli nation, right? Yes. So how are they faring now with all of this various crises that have happened in the last few years? Okay, uh, from day one, the Palestinian Israelis who were left in Israel, uh, they were in 1952, four years after Israel was created, they were given citizenship. Hmm. And the reason they were given citizenship because there were Palestinians that were ejected coming back into Palestine. So it really was not being generous to give them citizenship. It was to mark them, have the papers. You are, we gave you citizenship. Anybody who doesn't have these papers will be caught and ejected again. So that was the main reason. But immediately, immediately, what they did is they stripped all Palestinian villages and towns that remained. And by the way, the, the leader that was uh, directing the operations to eject the Palestinians out of Palestine mm -hmm. uh, was, uh, he was a Can Canadian Jew. And when it came to the Galilee, he refused to give the orders to push those people out. And big mistake, good mistake. But immediately after that, citizenship was given to those people and then the land was totally stripped from the these villages and towns. So they have no land at all. All of their land is gone. And uh, now they are ignored. The, the government funding goes to the Jewish towns and cities. Government, so if you go to Nazareth or any Arab town in Israel that are Israeli citizens, the Palestinians in those cities are living in crowded conditions because natural growth is gone, mm -hmm. it's not there. And when, ah. you, hear, when you hear about uh, 
you know that there are coexistence. Uh, very few places in Israel have coexistence. Haifa, you know, uh, some Arabs and uh, some Palestinians and the Israelis uh, live in the same neighborhoods, but very, uh, very segregated society. Schools so the population, the population is increasing then, a percentage oh, of, uh, yes. yeah. because of a uh, greater production yeah. of and the, the different laws, I want to mention, this is really, really important. I think we did this, you recorded it, Sandy, at uh, one of your uh, lectures, uh, where the Palestinians, anybody non-Jew has a citizenship, but the nationality law is only for Jews. Nationality law, I don't want to use the word, supersedes, I was going to say Trump's, supersedes the citizen's law. <laughs> you, Frank love but uh, yeah so uh, citizen law it's like you know you you have permanent citizenship but you are not a national like you have to be Jewish to be part of the nation of the Jews but so, you can vote you can vote if you, yeah yeah you can yeah. vote but again in the voting you know this is another lecture uh, i think it's important yeah. you really should listen to it because it is incredible very insidious how all of these laws you know i call him the jim crow of uh, our area uh, how all of these laws they were not allowed to form their own uh, parties they have to be party of another party so they are diluted their vote and uh, because that how would you explain they can vote 20 percent but none of them are in the prime ministership or the ministers or in any uh, positions uh, of any importance in the israeli government you know these are israeli citizens that are not or they are none of them are in any of the big companies right. in israel Musa, Musa, could I ask Peter? Hi, Peter and Betsy. Um, I'm wondering, Peter, do you have do you have any questions or any thoughts? Peter and I were together in Israel, Palestine at one point, right? And I wish I went with you, but it didn't work yeah, out. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> any anybody else? Because I do have a question. I think most of us know this, but I would like to have Musa discuss what's what's going on with the two state, one state so called solution. What's Peter, going on? Peter wanted to say something. Oh, Peter, I'm sorry. Peter. The point that I would want to make is that uh, this has been a long lasting uh, relationship, the Sister City program. Right. But, you know, going back to what, 1993? So, One, so 1991. 91. We started in 1991. We started in 91, but it was consummated in 93. Yes. So, uh, so almost 30, 30 years now. But uh, what can we do as a community to bring some new energy, some new blood, some young people into this relationship? Because this is all about creating awareness and informing people through conversations and dialogue. But, you know, as I look around uh, this room, you know, I'm one of the younger people here and this is uh Who i says? can't say that too often these days that uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. i'm the younger one in the crowd but i think we need to give some have some discussion as to what might be done to re-energize this uh sister city program i agree to connect with folks in uh, in bethlehem i was last there probably five years ago and i, I was amazed that uh they knew Burlington and they brought me into a room and they had every piece of correspondence, communication ever between Bethlehem and Burlington in, in this room. And they much, they've, did a, they've done a much better job of maintaining the, the history of this relationship than we have. But uh, my point is not about that, but it's about what can, might be done to create some new energy and bring some new people into this conversation. Uh, very I, I, ex oops, no, excellent no. question, uh, uh, Mayor Clevel. Yeah, <laughs> Mayor Clevel. Yeah, excellent. Now, you know, we did, we started, unfortunately, we were interrupted by COVID. We started a program with Champlain College that was right. going to involve, uh, what do you call it, uh, the uh, students, no, but it's the teachers, 
and the students, you know, on a, a project that involves, uh, you know, uh, photography and all of that. And uh, it was inter it started and it just happened to be uh, coincide with COVID. And we were hoping that we will harness, you know, some young people and professors, but everybody on this here is also invo uh, invited to join the sister city. We would love to have you. Uh, Musa, though, before, I, I really would like you to say something about, is there a change in attitude about one state, two states? What's going on? I mean, for the, for the United States, they've always talked that there has to be two states, right? And that doesn't, de facto, that's not happening. And I don't think it ever was planned or never could happen, as a matter of fact. And in my mind, de facto, it is one state. So what on earth is going on with this continual rap about two right. states? So, so to the powers, which are what counts, you know, to the United States and the politicians, the easy, safe retreat or position is to say two state. Oh, we believe in two state. Meanwhile, as I mentioned earlier, everything is being gobbled up. So they say two state, but they are not doing anything right. to stop Israel from gobbling up the West Bank. So, you know, I will be fine with two state if you allowed everything to be fixed in place until we fix it. But uh, the land is being stolen. The resources are being uh, carved up. And uh, so two state, I think for the politicians is safe uh, uh, retreat, but uh, in actuality, Israel is really gobbling up the whole place. You know, it's uh, and so who who basically has jurisdiction anyway? Really, Israel has. Isra Israel control. has. Do Israel controls the boundaries, the airs, the the skies, and the everything under the ground, which means water. You know, very important, and the land. You know, most of the land. So, if you, Paul has a question. Yeah, Paul. I, I had a question with regard to uh, aid aid to Palestine, and that is with the new positions that our senatorial delegation has in particular, do you think there's any hope of working through them to increase it? I hope yes. so. Who's, who's we, so you just, right. Yeah, we, we have to work on that, you know, with our government. It's, uh, it, you know, I'll tell you this. It probably one of the biggest pushers, <laughs> one of the biggest people to push for restoring what has been taken away from the Palestinians is probably Senator Leahy behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Our congressional, congressional delegation is wonderful, you know, on wanting some, some goodness for both sides. So uh, Senator Sanders today, he refused, he was one of uh, three that refused to sign uh, the deal about the Israeli embassy. Right, well, he was pushing Was there a deal to today? Back. Yes. Was there a deal today? What was uh, the Today deal? or yesterday, there was a vote, uh, 97 to three. Uh, Sanders, uh, uh, Warren. Warren and- uh, Carper. Carper uh, from oh. somewhere. Carper, I don't, I don't know who he is, but uh, Warren and Sanders- Three, uh, three, three only? Three only. Wow. Uh, were, uh, were against keeping the embassy in. But again, remember, Sandy, the Congress has been pushing for all yeah. of these good things forever. It's the administration that has prevented this from happening, the embassy move and uh, all of the above. So now it's in the, you know, it would have to be Biden and team to restore some of that uh, back. But- uh, and, you, and your prediction is what? What's your prediction about that, about Jerusalem? It's going to stay the way it is, right? Or what? Look, I mean, here's is, here is the problem about, you know, there is a good question about, your question is about single state or two right. state. A two state would be awesome if everything was fixed and then the Palestinians get, you know, what they wanted, which is the West Bank and Gaza with the access. You know, it's clear what would fix it and they allow to state and then maybe in the future i mean that would be the best option if they really have freedom the palestinians and then the palestinians and israelis join together in a federation or whatever you know they can come up with something the problem is israel is not allowing that and i don't think we'll ever allow it to have a, a separate state in 
under you know which is under its control now and uh, so the problem with one state though is once you become one state you can abuse your minority mm. actually will be the majority you can abuse and That's nobody will be. nobody will interfere because it's your business that's yeah. one one disadvantage right. to one state we know the power the power uh, is in the hands of the israelis uh, companies uh, military all of that if they become one state palestinians would be totally totally helpless yeah my my but my question is somewhat different musa de facto it is one state yeah, correct so we have we have to uh, the struggle should be for yeah. equality exactly uh, we yeah. we know you know the answer is if it is one state but israel is not going to allow it to happen and back by the united states uh, somebody has a question yeah. uh, said john well, I, i can't i can't see it john, john? uh you're muted right okay so hi mosa i don't know if you remember me we sure hi john uh, hi john i do we work together And um, I just have a few observations. I didn't even know about this group. Peter Clavel invited myself. Uh, I, I got an email a couple of days ago. Um, but one one of my observations for Vermont is, and I've been involved in this for about 20 years, um, is the, the number of organizations who are independent of each other, who don't know what the other organizations are doing and don't work together. If, right. if, if you could form a group of the, this group, you've got BTJP, you've got Jewish Voice for Peace, you've got the Episcopal Church, you've got Cliff Bennett down there in Waterbury with his group, you've got all these disjointed organizations, and we don't even talk to each other. So if you came together, you would probably have a better chance of making change. And in response to Peter's, uh, yeah, I, I, That's been the question for me all these years. Why isn't the University of Vermont these students? Uh, I mean, I was with a with a Palestinian doctor today, a 24 year old intern at uh, who was giving me a physical. He's Palestinian. He doesn't know about you know what's going on in the in Vermont about this. His mother is from Palestine. His father is from India. Yeah. There are young people, especially we have Bernie Sanders here. We have Leahy, but you know, I, you know, VTJP, we've been holding his feet to the fire for the Leahy law, right. which says you cannot give any military assistance to any country that right. commits human rights abuses. And I think that's something we can continue to pound on him, especially as he uh, is at the end of his career and leave a legacy for him to begin to push the Leahy law as it, the Episcopal Church, by the way, uh, passed three resolutions two years ago um, for the diocese of the Episcopal Church. So on the Leahy law, on apartheid and BDS, right. and the Episcopal Church, I think, has a, uh, a national uh, voice in Washington with the, with the Washington Cathedral, so we could work through them also. But my point is that as long as we continue to uh, work apart and not try to figure out how we can work together, uh, Vermont, we're just going to be uh, continue to spin our wheels. Right. Yeah. You know, I just want to mention, John, uh, one important factor about the Leahy law is if it is enacted, it has to go to the State Department and they are the ones who would apply it. So They this, certify it. So if they don't certify it, Leahy law and Leahy can uh, go somewhere and it's yeah, not well, we've heard, we've heard that we've heard that for 20 years, but now we've got the Senate and the House of Representatives and the presidency. Now it's I, time for the Leahy law, I, the, the the secretary, the State Department to to take action on the Leahy law. They can no longer I, use that as an excuse. I agree with you that yeah. uh, that's why you know early on in uh, this uh, discussion I mentioned. Uh, we are happy, or some of us are happy, that uh, Biden uh, is in and the other guy is out. But we really have to work on all right. kinds of issues, not just the Palestinian issue, on all kinds of issues to really fix what's broken. Right. And uh, we have to push Biden and his team on Palestine and the rest. Right. right. On Palestine, um, I told you my feeling, uh, they are not going to invest much capital unless we 
really make it make their life miserable and uh, we'll see Right. Okay, Musa, but um, again, what, I mean, I think John brought up an interesting point about how we can really do anything to change what's going on in Washington. That's a constant complaint from a lot of different groups right now. And I, I guess I would say, uh, I would ask you if you are at all encouraged, Musa, has there been a change in the years that you've been involved on this issue? Any changes at all? Ch changes, you know, it, I'll, to mention, we have to grab on anything positive. Right. Uh, right. For example, uh, Sanders has changed big right. time. He, yeah, he yeah. before we met with him, many of you here were in the room. He would not touch this issue with a 10 foot, uh, actually 20 foot uh, pole. Now he's fantastic. He really is. Right. I, we are right. very proud of him that mm -hmm. he's for justice and for uh, doing something. And uh, uh, Jimmy wants to say something. Jimmy. Yeah. Um, so, Jimmy Lee. Uh, so on on Friday, the um, pretrial ch chamber of the International Criminal Court came out with a decision yes. that um, recognized its the court's jurisdiction over right. the situation in Palestine uh, back to 2014 when there was a massive Israeli assault on Gaza, and I think it might also cover. Uh, Israeli uh, settlements in the occupied territories uh, and the violence uh, that Israel committed against hundreds of people in 2018 at the protest at the wall. It might also address Israeli apartheid. Um, mm -hmm. If they, So uh, do you think this is one of the positive developments I recently? Know. This was just on Friday. Friday. What does Musa think or anybody else? I think so, but maybe Musa has something to say about that. Musa? Musa? Yeah, where is he? What happened to him? Amir, Amir. <laughs> so on, uh, on the international court, it's already being uh, uh, rejected or pushed back at by our State Department. Already. By our State Department? Yes. So wow. it's not going to be an easy deal. But Beit Salam, you know, one positive thing, uh, Beit Salam, which is an Israeli human rights organization, uh, came out and said, you know, let's stop beating around the bush. Uh, Israel is an apartheid state. You know, when you treat two populations totally differently and subject them to different laws, you cannot keep saying, oh, we are the only democracy in the area. So Beit Salam, uh, this is, has been in the news, I'm sure if you missed it, uh, search for it came out and said, you know, just period, end of story. This is an apartheid situation. Uh, we have from the River Jordan to the sea is there are approximately 5 million Palestinians and 5 million Jews. They are about really? equal numbers. Yes, we can, we can, they can live in equality if the powers to be force the issue if they choose to. It's the only hope for me, it's the only hope for Israelis and Palestinians is equality under the law, where it's not Jewish state or a Christian state or a Muslim state. It's a state multicultural and good for everybody that lives there. And, and one they, man, one woman, one vote, right? That's one person, one vote. Right, right. <laughs> Absolutely, that's the only solution. And the people who, keep saying, oh, God maybe favors us a little bit, you know, over the other guys or are just wasting everybody's time and will end up uh, causing more pain and misery and dragging the situation out. There is no hope the, you know, Israel has tried everything to drive the Palestinians out. Checkpoints, there are 600 checkpoints in the West Bank. You cannot go from my village, which is say uh, Essex, to Burlington, which is only like eight miles without going through several checkpoints, you know. So you don't know if you are gonna make it to the hospital or to your work or to, so they live, Palestinians are living a miserable life under this occupation. And uh, it's not good, you know, the Israelis, they know they are abusers, you know, the army knows what they are doing and it's not good for abusers or abused, you know, and in the end they will consume everybody. I, I really believe equality under the law, one state for all, 
is the only solution and the sooner we work on it and that's what we should be working on all of us okay i think we're about out of time tonight any final questions or thoughts before we close and i might remind you all that next week we're doing another program on sister cities and i think uh, mayor clavel will be with us and i hope all of you are with this we're, next week we're going to be discussing our sister cities primarily in latin america our sister city in puerto cabezas which is Nicaragua, and which is also under siege right now, uh, largely by people who would like to uh, overthrow the government in Nicaragua and their allies, probably some of them find themselves in Washington. Um, and also we're gonna contrast that with US foreign policy. In other words, we're gonna talk about sister city diplomacy and US foreign policy next week. And we would welcome you all here because a lot of that's gonna have to do with sister cities as well. And sister cities, remember, are based on friendship. And I there think- are two, There are two questions, Sandy. One is yeah. by John and one is Robin. Okay, okay John. Robin or John, whoever first. John? Yeah, okay, you? so uh, in talking about uh, sister cities, I just want to uh, inform you that uh, VTJP, we're working with Rochester, New York. They do this famous film festival every October they show five films. They have a very good audience on Palestine. They take the whole year to select these films. And we are going in partnership with them to do a similar film festival in Vermont. Um, Super. And we're, we're underway with that, with Mark Hage and Excellent. Kathy Shapiro and Wafi and Russell. Very good. Yeah. Perfect. And who else? Do you have yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, Peter, I'd like to call you tomorrow. Um, I want to get out another sort of press release about the Pertiga Basis um, uh, webinar next Wednesday. So I'll give you a call. Please, please call me. Uh, we've raised some money. We're in contact on a, almost a daily basis with Pertiga Basis. They're really hurting and yeah, maybe we can help them. Wow, great. Okay. I just right. want to say... It, it was so good to see everybody here. You know, lots of uh, good friends that we haven't seen during this COVID uh, disaster. Mm -hmm. It's good to see you all, really. And thank you for being here. And thank, thank you for you, inviting Musa. me, Sandy. Sure. <laughs> thank you a lot, Ms. Musa. Thank you for all your work all over the, for many years. Okay, thank you. See you next week, I hope.